so um, Joe, who isn't anyway, so yes, so welcome to this uh, presentation about plants in the garden. And the idea behind this is that um, we will have, um, let me just hide that. What we're going to do is to have a presentation given by many different people in the garden about the plants in the garden. And the idea really is so that by preparing for the presentation, uh, people learn about the plants that are there. Um, and it becomes a kind of sharing session, really, where people share the knowledge that they have and share any questions they have and so on. Um, I'm going to start the presentation by talking about the design of the garden and really just briefly going over the thinking behind the design so that there's a context and also talk about where we've reached so far as well with the planting of the garden because that's been somewhat disrupted to say the least by COVID. So that's the plan and I am hoping that we will manage this without fairly straightforwardly because we're going to switch um obviously i'm going to switch between people speaking but once i'm sharing my screen with the presentation then i think it's just a question of people who are each person jumping in so we'll see how it goes and here we here we go now so i shall now start sharing the screen right so um, yes, yeah, so this is about plants in the Northwick Park Community Garden, presented by all the people listed and others, actually. I didn't put on Gillen, um, I'm afraid, sorry, Gillen, who's also going to do something on gourds and squash and so on at the end. So um, I'm going to start by, I just wanted to go back to the beginning and talk about the aims of the garden. Um, and this is what we outlined to the council. And what we outlined back in the beginning is to the idea is to create a food forest that offers a wide diversity of food for people to harvest through the year um, and to create a wildlife haven uh, that will provide pollen and nectar all year we've already seen that sort of starting to develop i think with the number of worms that we found when we were uh, planting the bulbs last year to create a space for people to enjoy with seating and places to relax and have picnics and um, the space will be low maintenance and that by maintaining the space it provides a way to create a sense of community which i think is is definitely happening and to provide somewhere that children can learn about nature um, their food and and also to have a space to play so those were the aims that were laid out um, back at the beginning they remain the same aims as uh, far as i understand it and I just wanted to explain what the food forest would consist of. So the idea is to have a very wide diversity of plants, most of which will provide an edible harvest. And that will include things like fruit, nuts, leaves, flowers, roots and tubers and mushrooms. And one of the things that I think is quite interesting is that there is a project at the moment well there's pro lots of projects actually around the world to look at the microbiome so in other words kind of like the soil food web in your gut you know it's kind of you know the um multitude of microbes that are in your gut and one of the things that they've realized is that the diversity of our microbiome so the diversity and range of microbes that we have in our guts is really drastically reduced um with in modern times and one of the things that they've identified as making the biggest difference to the diversity of those microbes is the question of how many different types of plant food you eat so um they they're now there's a recommendation now that you eat 30 different types of plant food each week so that will include things like fruit, nuts, leaves, flowers, roots and tubers and mushrooms. And I think that that's really interesting uh, insofar as the, the garden, once the garden's mature and everyone's been, uh, everything has been planted, that though that should mean that then there's, um, uh, there's a wide diversity of food for um, people to pick and to achieve that, to do that. So 
I think that's uh, that's really quite interesting as it, to put it into a different context. So the garden combines different layers of vegetation and this is really to mimic a woodland edge. And so the idea is that if, this, if Northwick Park was left um, without any intervention by humans, they, it would eventually um, turn into a forest. So the idea is to kind of mimic that, i.e. to mimic where nature wants to go with that space. Um, by combining, uh, creating a sort of woodland edge, really. So it will combine canopy trees, smaller trees, shrubs, herbaceous perennials, ground cover, rooting plants, climbers, and then we've also got some mushroom logs as well, where we're basically growing mushrooms um, within the logs. So in other words, there are plants that, that will be of different sizes, taking up different space in terms of height, and so on, um, and that all of those different levels and layers are represented in the garden. And here's a kind of picture that a guy called Graham Burnett's actually created, I believe, um, which just shows the different layers of a forest garden. Not necessarily, they don't have to be organized in this kind of um, sort of uh, scaling down but it does give you a sense of what would happen potentially on a, the edge of a woodland. Um, and so the combination of a canopy tree, a small tree, shrub, herbaceous perennials, roots, ground cover, and then you've got the climbers growing up, in this case, growing up the trees. So that's kind of the basis of the design. And this is the space with the um, initial this was how the design was laid out that was initially created. And it's taken a slightly different form, but you'll be able to see there's all of these shrubs have been planted all the way along here, um, which provide a windbreak. They've also actually go around the top here as well. And when we came to actually do the planting, the pathway had been adjusted. So it was going straight through so that s some of this planting is slightly different and slightly rearranged. So um, we do need to do an update of this. Um, you'll also notice that it's cut into two, broadly in two sections. And this section, instead of having the shrubs on this side, they're mostly planted in between the trees on this side of the pathway. And then this section is the section that we've done the least work on. We've planted the trees now and started on the, I think we've made a start on the windbreak shrubs, but um, possibly not. And there's a mixture of some herbaceous perennials and other um, plants here as well. So that was the kind of layout. Um, and there are three core ideas in, the, in terms of the design, which relates to a forest garden pattern. And the first is of the stacking of different heights of plants and different layers of plants and then there's the soil food web and the permaculture guilds and this is really about addressing the needs of the natural world or a, creating a context where it, the natural world is invited to um, really be healthy I guess to create a healthy uh, ecosystem and this is just a diagram just to show you the soil food web and how there's this interconnection of different um, beings within the soil food web who are who eat each other and are eaten by each other and fundamentally rely on the plants that are in the soil and um, the sort of dying down of vegetation on the surface of the soil. And that's really crucial, the health of the plants is related to, is dependent on the health of the soil food web. And that's why we've been putting a lot of emphasis on making sure that the soil is covered, that it's mulched, um, either with living mulch of plants or, and or with cardboard and wood chip, okay, to protect the soil. Um, and therefore also encourage all the other um, creatures that live above the soil as well. And then the plants are also organized uh, according to permaculture guilds. So you have plants which play different roles within the garden. You have nitrogen fixers, um, which take nitrogen from the air. Well, 
the plants don't actually, bacteria around their roots take nitrogen from the air and they feed it into the soil food web, into this kind of network of fungi and bacteria. And that nitrogen is then spread to feed other plants around um, through the soil food web network. Um, you have ground cover living mulch plants and they provide compost on the spot. So they kind of, as they die down, um, the leaves die down and so on, they uh, essentially provide a kind of composting process um, on top of the soil. They suppress weeds, they help the soil to retain moisture because there's an insulating layer and they also build fertility as they decompose. Then you have what are known as dynamic, dynamic mineral accumulators, which is a bit of a mouthful, but basically another word for them are nutrient catchers. And these are plants which collect particular nutrients in their leaves. Um, Comfrey being probably the queen, um, collects huge numbers of nutrients in, in their leaves. And they, they can be used uh, to create a plant tea, which we covered on a previous workshop. Um, they can also just be cut down and used as a mulch around um, other plants in the garden. And they, the minerals that they've collected in their leaves, as the plant leaves break down, those minerals become accessible, more accessible to the plants, um, the other plants around them. And then you have insect attractors, and I think probably the vast majority of plants in the garden are insect attractors. They have flowers um, that will attract bees and other pollinating insects. And once the plant, once the garden matures, it should be uh, just alive with bees, hoverflies, butterflies, and loads of other insects. Because not only will the flowers provide that nectar, but there's also a whole range of habitat as well that's created for those um, insects. So those are the three kind of, um, if you like, understandings which inform how the garden's been designed. And therefore the plants that are in the garden exist in this context where we've got trees, shrubs, herbaceous perennials, ground cover and so on. And we've got plants which are nitrogen fixers, we've got plants which are mineral accumulators, we've got plants which cover the ground. Um, and then we've also got uh, within the garden the, the, the approaches to protect the soil, to cover the soil, um, to protect the soil food web. So where we've got to so far, um, from the first load, uh, round of funding that uh, was given for to get the garden planted up, um, we've planted 42 trees and we've got eight left to plant, 105 shrubs, so we've got 85 left to plant, 110 per herbaceous perennials are already in and we've got another 115 left to plant and we've planted 15 ground cover with 185 left to plant. Those figures aren't exact, they're just, they're somewhat ballpark in terms of the numbers that we've got left to plant, but it's just to give you an idea of where we're at. And the plan was to have planted those in March, April and May this year. And of course that was all, and that's all been disrupted by um, the COVID crisis. And so we- When we say left to plant, are we, are they bought? No, no, they're just no, no, the, no. <laughs> in the plan, but not bought. They're yeah. in plan, they're not bought. Yeah. So we wouldn't, we'd buy them. Planted everything that we had purchased. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the idea is that then there are still, um, there's still quite a lot of planting left to do, as you can see. Um, but what we have done is mostly prepared the areas to plant. And that was a huge amount of work as, a lot of us will remember, I think, just digging over the turf and creating the kind of areas to, to plant. It's also the case that there have been other plants that have been added. Um, so we were talking about a couple that we'd, we'd transplanted in the hope that they might take or not, and we'll see whether or not they do. Um, and then there's also other people have planted added plants um, and Quite a lot of plants have been grown from seed. Quite a lot of plants are self-seeding. So, you know, the whole, it's starting to become a kind of dynamic garden, I would say, where, you know, there are plants that are kind of um, appearing and being added to, which is, which is just fantastic. 
But I think overall, I just wanted to create that context because it's, it's to kind of clarify that it, the idea behind it is to work with nature rather than against nature. And so to create a, a space which, yes, is, is kind of organized around what we want as humans because we want the food, but it's also um, providing food for the natural world as well, food and habitat, and um, is really organized around how to work with rather than against. So I just wanted to put that into context. So has anybody got any questions at this stage? At all, at all, at all. And it's really useful to see. I hadn't seen that whole plan before, I don't think. Right. Okay, that's good because it's hard to judge whether or not, um, you know, for people who have, then it might seem a bit repetitive. But um, that's good. Okay. Anybody else got any questions? Any more big yeah. circles to do. Um, how is the garden going to get any bigger? The land that it occupies. Uh, who is that? Sorry. But the um, Yvette. Yvette. Oh, hello, Yvette. Um, is it going to get bigger? Well, if you listened to Sonia, whose idea it was to have this, I think it kind of originated with her. Um, she has plans to take, or she had plans, I guess she probably still has plans to take over the entire park, including the golf course. So, um, <laughs> no, I'm slightly kidding. Yes, I think it would be good for the garden to extend. I think there's a lot of space which where... I think, you know, there's no reason why a lot more plants couldn't be added and grown, which are good for wildlife and good for humans. So I think the whole project is, I think personally is fantastic because I think it's, it means it's a, it's a um, legacy as well for future generations, because I think we're creating a space where there's going to be food with minimal amounts of maintenance needed relative to kind of organizing a vegetable garden, for example. Um, where the plants will, to a certain extent, take care of themselves. It can be used as an outdoor classroom. And so, yes, I think it'd be great. We haven't actually got agreement from the council for any other, to extend ourselves yet. So I think it's somewhat a question of kind of seeing how this goes and then we'll see where we end up with after that. Teresa. Uh, but I just, have we finished digging the big circles or are there, are there more of those to dig? I think we have, um, we've kind of, I think we've finished digging the big circles, broadly speaking. We still need circles for shrubs, for mm. the windbreak shrubs. Okay. Um, and I think we might possibly kind of adjust the shapes of the planting areas. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know that they'll necessarily remain as circles i think they'll be scoped to kind of make maybe <clears throat> point some up and create more spaces where you have to you know you kind of go into an area especially in the wider part but yes broadly speaking we've okay. got we've got the spaces are mostly done i would yeah. say okay good thanks any other questions um, I one thought that has crossed well, two thoughts that have crossed my mind. The first one is with respect to water supply. Indeed, <laughs> indeed, there is a question of water supply, um, and maybe I should pass over to Iris on that to answer that one. Yes, um, we likely, or fingers crossed, will have a meeting with Brand Council. It's not set up yet, but one of the councillors in the area is very keen to help us out and has contacted Viola, or someone senior within Viola, and we may have a meeting with the councillor and with Viola, hopefully in the, in the coming weeks. Once our key contact, Khalid, and is back at Brent Council, she's currently on annual leave, I think I'll speak to her and then hopefully we can find out if there are any other options rather than doing the manual heavy lifting of water bottles over to the mm. garden, which may, may still do, but we may get some help, fingers crossed. Great. And the second thought that crossed my mind was that 
when we meet on Sunday and we all work so hard mm -hmm. and then we just go away and I was just thinking are we at some point going to create like a pergola or seating area and it would make a nice sort of um, picnic spot so I don't know if you if that was like some very new plan well the idea was that there was going to be space for people to um to sit and have picnics but the in terms of a pergola there are issues with creating structures um that the council are concerned about for a number of different reasons and so they weren't particularly keen on us creating structures and including those in the design i think it'll somewhat depend um i think that there's no reason in this weather why we, you know, I mean, it, obviously, I think that, I mean, this is just my view. So, you know, others can say, but I think, you know, mm. that the idea is that there are the, the seating areas and the, I think, I mean, certainly when I was up there, people were using the space to... People are frequently sat on the, yeah, on the round water collector seating things when I walk past. There's, all, there's frequently people up there. Yeah taking in the view and having a little sit in the chat yeah bottle of beer when i was there yesterday <laughs> having a bottle of beer there <laughs> yeah i mean i think it's created a really nice space and obviously what we what we expect to be doing would be perma blitzes where we come together in quite a large group i mean that's what we were doing this time last year actually was coming together as a large group doing a load of work eating unbelievable amounts of food from really really delicious food and then doing some more work and then eating more food and then <laughs> doing some more work <laughs> so does yeah that, normally there's Alice Yogi here hello hi sorry uh, to, to answer uh, Toju's uh, question really uh, I had been speaking to Leslie Williams at Brent Council about tree planting and um, for memorial uh, and uh, with uh, with the seating arrangements, uh, have benches and that sort of thing. And he said to me that to have a seat, a bench, uh, you know, three or four uh, person seat, I think it would probably work out something like anything between fifteen hundred and two thousand pounds each. Wow! Because you have to prepare the ground, uh, concrete it, put the bench in, secure it. The bench costs uh, uh, something like five hundred pounds. Um, so it's it's a big cost, and um, you know, to, to just just for a simple bench. So imagine uh, how much um, you know a structure like a pergola would would, would cost, and whatever, apart from vandalism, etc. So <clears throat> uh, maybe a bench could be an idea, but it's it's expensive. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, just uh, for me, Rish, as a point for me, Rish, just uh, based is that um, I guess with the design, the idea was to have there's certain openings and sections, which at the moment, obviously, uh, some of the people, Iris has brought a scythe along and we started to kind of clear clear some of the long grass. But the idea would be there are sections where there are openings, whether they're around the benches or around certain beds, and also to include a few more of those log grounds that you might see up at the, 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 cent the centre of the... Um, up, the, up at the, the kind of the main body of the uh, garden but just to have them dotted around or have kind of areas to congregate a little bit but using kind of natural features of of the log grounds or logs on on their sides so these are things we'd like to just kind of get hold of and bring over obviously quite heavy and difficult to get over but you know as things move forward we like to build those little areas up and as we clear a bit of grass you know and and there's a bit of wear that you know uh, these kind of spaces open up and you know naturally form almost uh, so I think that kind of, uh, you know, and, and another thing we I remember Susanna, we were talking about doing the, the arches, the, um, exactly, yeah. the weaved, the weaved arches, which again, these things have been postponed, but you know, something that, that will add feature and add a bit of a focal point, uh, yeah. to, you know, mm -hmm. for people to congregate around, you know? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I mean, I think the, overall, the idea is that it's quite natural. So it's a bit like going and sitting in a field if you know what I mean, rather than it being quite parky, you know, because yeah. obviously it's a park, but the, and we have got the benches, the water, which are really cleverly designed to catch water as well, which hopefully there will be at the moment. 
um, because we've actually got some rain. But the idea is that I think that it's a place where people can go and it's not too cultivated, <clears throat> you know what I mean? So. Yeah, and we also have two, uh, uh, two more sets of those benches coming that we'll be having in the next few weeks, hopefully. Cool. That need to go in, that have, they're part of the plan, so they need to go in the garden. I think we can kind of discuss where they get positioned as well, I think. Yeah, cool. Anybody else? Any other things? I mean, I think it's, it's really, um, it's really good to have an opportunity because for everyone who's involved in the garden to kind of come together and, and kind of talk about what the plans are and how things are going. And it's, I think I've, I've sort of forget now because it's been however many long months since we started with lockdown, I kind of forget where we would have been at if we hadn't had that you know which would have been that there would have been loads more planting done we would have had a whole you know number of perma blitzes taking place um so things would look very different and you know even now obviously it's and we can't organize events in the garden you can't you know invite people lots and lots of people to come together <laughs> we still can't organize perma blitzes and so we're going to have to look at plans over the autumn, um, especially in the light of the fact that as everything opens up, there's a possibility for, you know, who knows whether or not there'll be a second wave and, and so on. So, um, you know, I think it's, it has somewhat been um, put back, you know, been de delayed, but at the same time also there've been really positive things that have happened as well. So, um, yeah. Okay, so I am going to propose that what we do now is move to the presentation. And well, sorry, we've been in the presentation. What I mean is that we are going to start with Mulberry and Ellery. So are you you're going to control the PowerPoint while I I'm going to control the PowerPoint, okay. I think, because otherwise it gets confused. That's you know. fine. Yeah? As long as I know. Yep. Uh, okay, so why I pick Mulberry. Um, so I thought I'd start with some quick facts and these come from the RHS. Um, because I'm a librarian, so I'm going to tell you about my sources. Um, and actually, it's, it seems like quite an easy tree to grow. But this is particularly the black mulberry. Um, and that seems to grow quite well in the UK. Um, it's quite slow to grow and it lights open and sunny aspects so the one we've got in the garden should be in exactly the right position. Um, we can move on to the next one because I'm sure people can read that. Um, yes, so any ideas why I've got this image? <laughs> Use chat or you can speak, I don't mind. These, these are guys that work on the tip tree, you know the people who make jam, tip tree? Seriously? The tip tree. <laughs> wow. It's the final point. So if you want to avoid the food staining your hands like this, you wear gloves. And I think she <laughs> yeah, aren't wearing gloves. So I thought they had reason. gloves on. Sorry. No, I, I, I don't gloves. think he does. <laughs> Looking at it in big, he doesn't. Right. I think they're quite proud. <laughs> um, so it's only three weeks of picking. It's got a very short span. And Tip Tree have got some ancient uh, mulberry trees. So it is part of their jam cycle. Wow. You can see it's quite slow to fruit, um, eight or nine years after planting. So the one we've got in the garden does actually have some fruit on it. And it, it <coughs> has to be, to be honest, I think it could do with some better pruning, but you can see it kind of in the background, I think it's a mulberry tree. So you can see it kind of grows in this lovely gnarled shape. It's not quite as contorted as the one we have, but you can also cut it into all sorts of shapes. Okay, next slide. So I thought I'd ask you, what springs to mind when we talk about mulberries? What immediately comes into your mind? You can use chat or you can use... Here we go round the mulberry bush. The yep. mulberry bush, the mulberry bush. Yeah. <laughs> what else? Pretty handbag. <laughs> Handbags, yeah, made of. <laughs> yes, Not no, mulberry. true, actually. Yeah, well, actually, you know, I discovered, I, wrote, I worked out which typeface mulberry use, yes. Sorry? Really? Gillen say? Nothing. Pardon? Anything else that springs to mind? Silk. 
Yeah. Okay, next slide. There you go. So, um, Gillen got exactly the right one. Here we go around the mulberry bush and obviously with silk, silkworms and cocoons. The thing to say is the mulberry tree we have will not support silkworms. Uh, it likes white mulberries, not, not the black mulberry that we have. Um, and if we move on to the next slide, I've, there's loads of, I, I got really into the history of and the mythology around, it, it's absolutely fascinating. So the idea of the mulberry bush uh, nursery rhyme is it was to do with female prison, uh, prisoners in the um, yard at Wakefield Prison. Um, and they would go round the mulberry bush planted in the middle. And the idea is that it died in, um, it's been there since who knows when, it died in 2017, um, cuttings were taken and they're grown um, again in HMP Wakefield. And it says it's on their website. You look at their website, there's no mention of it. <laughs> Here it's a big myth um, and in fact the mulberry tree they were referring to they think was probably more a sort of barberry not really a mulberry tree at, at all but it was quite good for alliteration all these sorts of things and then the second one um, about the rhyme is it's about the struggle that the UK had or Britain had to produce silk um, and Bill Bryson, and I think it must be in his short history of the UK, <coughs> quite find out where he said this. Um, it, it was to emulate this Chinese silk industry. So they brought in lots of mulberry trees into the UK, but they didn't survive particularly well. They're, they're, the ones they brought in were sensitive to frost. So uh, again, they think, here we go around the mulberry bush on a cold and frosty morning, maybe about the problems the industry faced. So that's two myths, I'm afraid, or one myth about the mulberry tree. So if we move on to the next slide, um, there's all sorts of popular stories of how mulberries came into the UK and on the left hand side of the picture those are mulberries so white red and black um, they are growing quite a lot in the US um, it's a big thing uh, looking at websites but again the idea is it was planted by a gardener at Buckingham Palace it was all the rage about 1608 uh, um, acres of mulberry trees again for about the silk industry they all wanted silk it's the latest thing um, and ordering landowners to plant, plant, uh, plant 10,000 mulberry trees each. Um, but again, they brought the black one and silkworms only eat white mulberries. So that was a big fail. Um, and they think again, the oldest one um, from this era is in uh, Charlton House in Greenwich. Um, and then the, the um, Buckingham Palace actually have a national collection of 27 varieties of mulberries. I don't know if we can go visit them, but um, they're described as, I've never tasted one, but they're compared to raspberries, but more, but kind of like a blackberry. So um, I, think, I think to try one would be really interesting. And at the bottom is a really, really good website, um, Morris Lundium um, Research. And it shows you where mulberry tra trees, it's got a, a really good map, an interactive map that shows you where mulberry trees are, um, I think mainly in London. And there's one, I think there's two in Fryant Park. There's one apparently in Preston Manor School. And I went to that school. I don't remember the mulberry tree there. <laughs> um, so you can actually look at where they are in, in, in relation to where you live. And the person who created the website has written a book on mulberries as well. So I thoroughly recommend the website. It's beautifully designed um, and it's got really interesting content. So I figure once our tree is kind of more established, we should try and get the tree onto that map as well. Um, and he obviously goes around and visits all the, all the mulberry trees in areas and um, documents them as well. So as I say, that's one of the nicest websites I've seen relating to the mulberry tree. And it looks, it just, it's, it's based in really good um, established research as well. <clears throat> okay, next slide. So I found some ideas uh, and in relation particularly to health uh, and actually knowing me, I have found some quite horrible things as well. So um, leaves of the trees were used by the Romans for diseases of the mouth, trachea and lungs. Things I've read about mulberry tree leaves is it's not a great idea to actually eat them because they're quite, um, they have a sort of um, sap that can, can be an irritant. Um, and I've also seen where people have created, um, sort of use extract of the leaves to create um, 
tablet form, which is probably a better way of taking it if you do want to take it. I'm not sure I would do what the Romans do though. Um, what I have found though is that they are a good source of iron, which I think is quite interesting for a fruit. Vitamin C, which I think is more obvious. Um, and they've been doing sort of, I think quite a bit limited research as in they didn't have a huge amount of participants. But um, in that small piece of research, uh, they did seem to lower cholesterol, blood sugar, which is great for diabetes, um, people with diabetes and possibly cancer risk. Um, and Chinese herbal medicine used them as well, um, being, being quite, well, I suppose mulberries are a native of China. Um, but it, the evidence about supporting the effectiveness isn't so hot. And again, as I say, it was a small baseline that they used. But there, again, this is quite a sensible web, website, healthline.com, if you do want to look them up. Uh, and then the nice bit, you know, 17th century, bark of the roots, you're basically using all bits of it. Uh, expel tapeworm. So if anyone's got a tapeworm, um, again, I probably wouldn't do that. Um, <laughs> Roots of the mulberry tree, often used by the devil to polish his boots. And therefore they're associated with evil. I don't know how he would polish his boots. Would he rub, I guess he'd rub his boot on, on the root? I don't know. Um, and in the US, uh, they are notorious for their pollen production. And again, I don't know if they have a different type there, but several uh, states banned them. Um, and now they're contemplating that possibly this was not entirely the reason. They're a bit like birch pollen in terms of reactions people have. It sounds terrible, but I think a lot of it, again, you can see there's a lot of mythology around it and ideas around them. And I think um, a, a kind of, I think sometimes they aren't always established facts. Okay, next slide. So I thought, well, I think it's gonna take a long time for us to get mulberries off that mulberry tree, although we have seen a few. So again, I mentioned um, tip tree produce a mulberry jam that uh, might be worth trying. Holland and Barrett uh, do a lot of dried mulberry items, um, including one, uh, some dried mulberries in chocolate. So that's, a, and I think they do a mixed bag that looks like it's different kinds of mulberries. And then Crocus do this miniature mulberry tree which in their picture is fruiting. And it's very cheap actually, it's about 15 pounds. It's about 13 centimeters in diameter, but it is a miniature version. So again, if anyone's interested, that might be quite a good one to buy. And I suspect you don't put it in the ground, I suspect you leave it in the pot, judging by their pictures. And thank you, that was it. Oh, thank you, Larry. And is Sarah there? Um, yeah, yeah, I'm here, sorry. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, there we go. All right, so um, I'm gonna to talk to you about the autumn olive. Um, and the olive trees are the ones that are eventually going to be windbreaks. So they're the ones along the edge. I believe those are autumn olives. Um, so at the moment, those don't have any berries, but when they do, they'll look like this. They'll have the olives. Um, if you go to the next slide. Um, this is how the, the picture at the bottom there is, is I'm guessing what they're going to look like eventually, but I'm not sure how long it's going to take to get to that stage. The ones we've got are a lot of mini versions of that. Um, so next slide. Mine's a lot shorter than Ellery's, sorry. Um, so yeah, I looked it up. The main kind of use that I could find for it was to use a fruit to make jam. That was like universal. All the websites said you can make jam with it. Um, you can actually store the fruit for up to 15 days. So when, they, when it does come into fruit, we'll be able to do that. Um, and then different websites had different kind of suggestions for the medicinal uses, um, but they're definitely a good source of vitamin A, C, and E. Um, apparently they can be used for um, coughs. And I think it was this website, this natural medicinal herbs also suggested that it can be used for kind of any breathing condition. And they didn't really specify like, whether that's the jam or the fruit or what you have to do with it in order to use it for these breathing conditions. Um, I then found a website that basically claimed you could use autumn olive for any, it was cancer listed, diabetes, I mean you name the illness it claimed that it could be used for that but I wasn't 100% convinced. Um, so I stuck with this, but it's definitely they, they are good sources of vitamin A, C and E. Um, so if you go to the next slide. 
Um, they have a few benefits. Obviously, they when they are in flower, they attract pollinators. Um, the like wildlife in general likes the berries, so birds in particular like to eat the berries, and they are a nitrogen fixer, um, which Susanna was explaining earlier on. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, um, probably the main benefit, and I think the reason they were chosen, is because they make a really good wind protecting screen. Um, and the website actually was on the previous page that the website I checked said that they're really good for making kind of like, yeah, this UVIC permaculture. Um, it suggested that they're particularly good for making a kind of informal hedge because they kind of grow in width as well as height. And they basically become kind of these big sort of um, tree shrub type things that, that block wind. Um, they're pretty hardy. So they pretty much grow anywhere. Um, so a lot of a lot of the websites I checked kind of warned against having them because they're seen as an invasive species because they're so strong. So I think it's one of those plants you have to kind of know what it's going to look like after a few years. You might not want it in your front garden, but it's good for what we're using it for, I guess. Um, and I think that was all I had, actually. Yeah, no, that's really good. I think it's an invasive species in other parts of the world. I don't think it's, oh, okay. it's not invasive here. Um, I've, I think it's, you know, possibly other places where it could naturalize, but it hasn't naturalized here as far as I understand okay. it at any rate. But yeah, that's really, it's really, it's really good. I have been in a forest garden with um, autumn olives as a windbreak and they do really bush up and they're really dense. Um, and it's amazing when you're in a, a windbreak because it's so kind of peaceful and quiet. So I'm hoping that that's what that'll create that kind of um, space. Given there's so much wind that blows up and down that blows up and down the the, the fields. So yeah, yeah, we definitely noticed that on Sunday. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> yeah cool. it was quite interesting because a lot of the sites kind of said no, 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 I don't plant this. So it was kind of interesting to see that. It really depends what you're using it for and, and where you put it and why you yeah. want it. Yeah. That's yeah. Quite cool. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Cool. Thank you. Rish. Yeah. So um, I we're, we're looking at uh, the black current, which I'm sure most people are familiar with the name um, and know of them. And so you can see we've got a few dots around the garden at the moment. And you can, uh, some of the berries are coming through right now. Uh, we haven't got masses, but they're there. Um, I've also on the top right picture you've got some of the flowers that were there earlier this year and then and then just a picture of what it would look like in winter actually so um, just to give you kind of a, a sort of overview of kind of what it looks like throughout the year and um, yeah next slide please so in terms of the, the you know the uses and how we can eat them uh, you can eat them raw they're quite like a tart, sharp, sharp flavour. But we most most of us know them as kind of with you've been using juices and jams and stuff like that, you know, in desserts, sauces. Um, they actually they actually are like a superfood, you know, with they're, they're you know, the trendy ones these days are goji berries and things like that, but black currants have extremely high vitamin C, the active, antioxidants and the poly, polyphenols, which I always get mixed up with the pronunciation but which are all yeah very, all the good stuff the anti-aging stuff that you know that everybody's into these days put it that way um and also i found that the the seed oil can be used um which is just a good source of omega-6 so it's one of these one of these foods that these days i guess uh, people are really into you know so um in terms of medicinal side um you can create kind of that it has been used in the past for sore throats and actually made into lozenges i'm sure it's one of these flavors that you end up getting for a lot of the commercial ones that you buy um and also you can use the leaves uh to make a sort of cleansing detox tea i mean so i found a, a huge list of different things that it's been used for you know different uh, conditions that it's been used to treat in you know historically uh the same website did also explain that uh with today's science none of this stuff is like scientifically sound but you know that's all right isn't it you can always try it <laughs> so uh next please um obviously the, the you know the berries are definitely uh, you know every, all the animals want them birds want them we want them so 
you know, it, it could it could to attract the wildlife and uh, the flowers are a good source of early nectar for the bees and other insects. So earlier on in the year, they come out, um, you know, just to keep keep the insects, you know, there throughout the year, which is pretty important actually. Uh, next, please. Um, so also that the berries and leaves have been used as dyes. Actually, they can be used as dyes. So the berries produce a blue or violet color, um, and the leaves give a sort of yellow color. One other little fun fact that I forgot to put in there is um, that I read that in America in the last century there were actually black currants were banned and sort of seen as a forbidden, forbidden plant to have because there was a certain fungus on them that was spreading to the pine, the pine trees. Uh, which was causing issues for, well, all, all the pine industry and the, and the timber industry in the, in the US, so they actually banned them, which I think they have started to create, uh, in the last 50 odd years, they've kind of created uh, species that are resilient to it, so they're kind of coming back, but for, hence, you know, it's, it's kind of a, 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 almost a bigger deal in the US to get hold of some black currants almost um, because of that. So, yeah, so I mean, uh, you can see them in the garden right now, uh, if you go over there, there's a few dotted around, and uh, yeah, that's it. Cool. Thank you, Rish. All good. And Iris. Yes, I'm talking about fennel. I didn't know much about fennel, to be honest, other than it goes very well with fish. So I've had lots of detail on the slides. <laughs> I was very excited about what I found. Um, so yeah, it was used as an old household remedy and was introduced by the Romans. But I since found out that apparently it goes back a very long time ago, even 3000 years BC, it was used by Mesopotamians as a medicinal herb. And also I think King Edward I used it as a condiment and to suppress appetite. And apparently it was used in the olden days as well by churchgoers if they were fasting, if they were going through Lent, for example, and they couldn't eat for a long time, or generally fasting, they used to sit in church and chew the seeds of the fennel. So I think there must have been quite a funny picture, actually, everyone kind of quietly chewing on something, trying not to pass out uh, of hunger. But yes, there is a picture here of the fennel plant that we have in the community garden. And apparently it grows up to two meter tall. It's quite tall already, I think, probably nearly up to a meter. And I think it's blooming as well. It's difficult to see from the photos here because it wasn't a sunny day. But I think some fennel has started to bloom already. I don't know if you've noticed maybe when you're walking through it. So yes, I think that's probably all. And it's a member of the carrot family, which I thought was interesting as well. And it's good that it can tolerate short drought periods, which we are having from time to time, or already had actually, this year during May and June. So yes, next slide please. So it's got quite a lot of edible uses. I mean, I've only had the fennel bulb in salads, for example, with coleslaw that goes really well because it's got a nice crunch to it. I haven't had it, I haven't had the foliage or I haven't had the flower. But apparently you can make pesto with the foliage of fonts, it's also called, and then the flower and pollen goes well on rice or pasta, or you can sprinkle it on fish. And what I'd like to try out is actually what I said here at the bottom, that I'd like to have this recipe where you have the fennel bulbs caramelized in butter and sugar and then goat cheese scattered over it. I love goat cheese, so I think I'll I'll make that and then put a photo up, <laughs> share a photo with you soon. So yes, I think that's probably all on here. Unless you've got some recipes that you used before with fennel. Has anyone cooked with fennel before? I've used mm. it with fish, um, mm. with the fronds. Really... There's lots of recipes to use the roots though, you're right, Elise. I have a fish. I have a fair number of um, fennel plants uh, that have like self-seeded and um, when when the flower is going to seed, the, the seed is actually, uh, certainly in India they use it as breath freshener when it is dried and um, it just self-seeds every year and yeah. comes yeah. up. Yeah. 
yeah, but I've never, I've never yeah. known it to produce a bulb. And I wasn't sure that the fennel bulb was the same as the one that grows mm. in my garden. Mm. Because I've, only, I've never ever come across a bulb on that. No, no that's right. Yeah, I think in the community garden, if I'm not wrong, Susanna, we've got the fennel that's called Florence or something that doesn't produce a bulb. But then there are the fennel types that produce a bulb. Yeah. Yeah, I think the fennel bulb is, uh, the fennel that produces a bulb is a variety. I, I don't know, but I think it's probably been cultivated in Italy. Um, so it's it's been bred as it were, you know, so that it's, it because fennel already has quite a chunky root. I think it's just that someone's bred uh, varieties that will then produce a, a bigger bulb. And it's something you, you plant that now so that it's grown as an annual, where you plant the seeds now and then the bulb will be ready in, I don't know, three or so months, three or four months, and then you harvest it. And then that's the end of the plant. So it's slightly different. The fennel that's in the garden is a perennial because obviously you're not, in when you harvest the bulb you're harvesting the whole root so then the whole plant dies but it is delicious really nice the fennel bulb so you know if somebody wanted to plant some uh seeds and then put them in the garden that'd be i think that'd be that'd be cool yeah i was, I was gonna say yeah like uh fennel is definitely widely used in like indian asian cooking um and and like taji said is um the seeds are used as a kind of after meal, I think digestive aid and mouth freshener. And actually, I think last, is it last August, is I know if I'm correct, that I think the seeds, that's the end of when the seeding happens on the plants that we have at the garden. And I managed to grab a few and I tasted those and they were just really, that even the flavour of one alone was a whole hell of a lot stronger than the kind of dried ones that we have at home that come in big packets, like straight off of it. It was like amazingly, just a really strong, really nice flavour actually yeah cool mm. yeah that leads on to us on to actually the medicinal uses the next slide please and i was amazed actually what you can use it for so i'm going to order some seeds and then try out some of these recipes which aren't mine i've got them from the internet without referring the source but i think it's amazing really that you can use it to exfoliate your skin and to you know to against colics and even to help with weight loss and also fennel oil, I think, although I haven't tried it, but after reading all this on the internet, I think I will try it. It's got many um, healing uses as well. Don't know if anyone on the call has used fennel before, has had fennel tea or fennel oil. Yeah, I've had the tea, definitely, yes. Yeah. I think I've got some of the tea at home, actually. Yeah, I've had the tea because they a lot of the sort of digestive herbal teas have fennel in them, don't they? Yeah, they do. Yeah. I think I've got some with some fennel in alongside other things. Yeah, yeah. the carminative is quite uh, commonly used, especially if you eat spicy curries, and then they always eat it afterwards. They sometimes also have it like sugar coated in restaurants on your way out. They tend to give it to you to eat. Oh, interesting. Mm. So yeah, I think these were the main points on this slide. Thank you. Then yeah, fennel has a great benefit for wildlife. And it's interesting that the flowers are very attractive for to wasps and hoverflies and bees. And then the seeds are eaten by birds in autumn and winter. But what I found interesting is about the stems, that it's in a hibernation place for insects. And then also the benefits to the soil food web is Again, I found interesting that you mulch with it at the end of the season, and then it's a good accumulator of phosphorus, if I pronounce that correctly. And apparently if you have fennel in your garden, it helps to control the aphids. So I'm thinking actually about planting fennel in my garden. I think I will now as well. <laughs> it sounds <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> Oh, yes, and then I think in ancient Greece, that's what I found. You may know some other countries, Susanna, but tried fennel stalks were used as as musical instruments, maybe as flutes, things like yeah. that. Cool. I think it had quite a. I have a feeling it had a. They have a um, 
spiritual significance. I suspect there's some, there might be in one of the myths, maybe. I'm not sure. I'm a bit ignorant, I'm afraid. But Hello. yeah. Hello? Oh, sorry, it's Teresa. I just oh. lost Zoom. Oh, it's right. Okay. Cool. I'm back. <laughs> That's really cool, um, Iris. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Are you all right to speak? Teresa? Yes, yes, yeah. Great. yeah. Oh, let's come back again. Um, I picked rhubarb because it's uh, something I really like to eat and I always find the season's quite short and I kind of miss it and don't eat enough of it. Um, so the, the, the photograph is actually a, one of the rhubarb plants in the community garden. I think there's two or three, but they seem to be thriving. They've managed to get through the drought and they're looking pretty good at the minute. Um, you can go on to the next slide, please. There's, um, just talking about rhubarb in general, there are lots and lots of different varieties and they all have these wonderful names like Timperley Early is quite um, a common one or something called Victoria or there's one called Prince Albert I think. I've got one in my garden that's called Champagne but they've all got different characteristics and it depends whether the, the stalks are thin or thick know whether the stalks are red or green and then generally the size of leaf and the size of the plant so if you want to put one in your garden just check what size it's going to grow to because some are over like a meter 1.2 meters wide or you can get slightly smaller ones so they're generally bought um, as a crown which is like the it's not quite bold but it's the underground bit and you buy those in the middle of winter they haven't got any leaves on you, you plant those and the, the leaves will gradually appear through spring. So it's best to plant them um, October, December, or certainly by mid-March. And you're supposed to leave the, the stalks, not pick them in the first year. So you let the plant um, establish itself. And you don't steal, steal the stalks from it, but you can pick from the second year onwards. But you should always leave three to five stalks on the plant so that it's got enough um, leaves to keep it growing and keep it photosynthesizing. Um, and I, I read you should stop harvesting by, I'm not sure whether it's the beginning of July or the end of July, to then let the plant grow again and maintain its reserves and its resources for the next year. But also the, I think the stems become a little bit more acidic. They have um, increased amounts of oxalic acid if you leave them too much into the summer. So that's why it's best to uh, stop harvesting them. Um, obviously, rhubarb and custard is quite a common combination of things to eat. Rhubarb crumble, you can put them into stalks into pies, cakes, jams. You can freeze the chunks as well. Uh, and I did read if you eat too much of it, it can have laxative effects. So watch out. Um, the next slide. Benefits to wildlife. I couldn't think of too many, but I could think of that the large leaves maybe provide a bit of shelter and shade for small creatures perhaps and the large leaves might act as a, a rain catching device <laughs> and so the plant is almost getting water onto itself. Um, I have read that if you want to use the leaves for a, another purpose you can make a something that will ward off um, caterpillars that might eat your cabbages for example and other leaf eating insects um, and I think I tried this a couple of years ago with boiling up the leaves, um, cooling them, straining them. You can add a few bits of soap flakes and then you spray on the plants to deter insects and caterpillars. So it might be that this oxalic acid that's in the, the, the leaves and the plants deters insects. Um, next slide. Yeah, just to go back to the origins of uh, rhubarb. I think it originated in East Asia and then people brought it along the silk routes into Europe. And then if you've heard of the Yorkshire rhubarb triangle, which is supposedly an area in Yorkshire that um, where a lot of commercial rhubarb is grown. And I read that it was a, a nine square mile area between Wakefield and Leeds mostly. And it, in the past, I think it used to go over towards Bradford. So it's, it's quite a small area but it's sort of changed over the years with um, commercial rhubarb growing. But there are um, historic houses which tend to have a lot of rhubarb growing in their walled kitchen garden. So if you ever visit these places, go and have a, a look. 
And I want to specifically mem mention um, Clumber Park, which is part of the National Forest. Um, it's in Nottinghamshire. I grew up in Doncaster and we used to visit Clumber Park regularly. But they've renovated their kitchen garden and they have a national rhubarb collection. So they've got more than 130 varieties. And I, can go and, I do remember going and seeing them all and thinking, goodness, how many different types of rhubarb can you have? But then Harlow Carr and Wisley Gardens also have um, the Royal Horticultural Society collections. Um, going back to the, the Yorkshire rhubarb triangle, they, you can force rhubarb to grow on very early in the year. So you put a pot over the leaves as they emerge. So it actually keeps the light out and they grow in the dark, but then the stems grow up. Um, to be very sort of tender and sweet and they appear earlier in the year. I don't think we'll be doing that in the community garden somehow. Um, I think that's probably about it. When you're picking rhubarb, you're supposed to, you don't cut the stalks, you kind of grab it right down the bottom and you pull and twist at the same time. So you're kind of breaking the stalks off gently and I think then that may stimulate another leaf to appear. Um, I think other benefits to health, perhaps it's a good source of vitamin K apparently, which is good for blood clotting and bone health. Obviously got a lot of fiber in, um, possibly some, it's a good source of calcium, vitamin C, and again, your antioxidants. So if you like a, a kind of sharp, Fruit. And again, I read it, it's more accurately, it should be described as a vegetable because it's the stalks that you eat. It's not the fruit that's, or the flowers that have formed the fruit, it's just the stalks, so it might be classed as a vegetable. But it's something I really like. I think that's about it. Unless there's Ooh. another slide, is there? No, there isn't. That's it. Okay. That was really, really interesting. Cool. Okay. Any questions? No? I can tell you a slightly amusing story though. My younger sister we used to have rhubarb. My dad's a very keen gardener and we had rhubarb growing in our garden. And when she was only about two, she used to go down the end of the garden and pick the stalks and just eat them raw. She really liked them. And she got told off for doing it until she wasn't allowed to pick them. So instead she went down and lay on the floor and just ate up the stalks from lying on the ground. So when my parents went <laughs> to pick the rhubarb, it was all chewed. So... <laughs> <laughs> oh that's good <laughs> does she still like them like that does she still like them that raw? i think she still likes them raw yeah i'll have to ask her she's the one i'm going to see at the weekend i'll remind her see if what she says i know she certainly likes the rhubarb crumble she makes it frequently mm. wow yeah well i mean i think hopefully the rhubarb in the garden should grow really big but it is going to need another i'd suggest we leave it next year as well so it gets a really good root system growing and then start harvesting after that. And I think we probably, by the sounds of it, need more. <laughs> <laughs> we'll all be wanting it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Quite a lot more probably. <laughs> so we can add some more next. We know. could be the Wembley rhubarb triangle. <laughs> That's true, yeah. <laughs> North Tweakle triangle, yes. yes exactly. Oh, well, I was going to do, um, I'm doing hemorrhicalis or daylilies of which there are some in the garden. I'm not sure if they've flowered or not, or how they're doing, because I haven't been to the garden for a while, but hopefully in due course, they'll look like this, because this is the variety that has been planted. Um, and so they're really pretty, um, and they're, they are um, edible. So the, the um, buds are edible, in fact, used commercially in China. So here's a packet of the buds that have been dried. Um, and these are uh, buds which are also, I think they're, those look fresher actually. Um, and so that's, they, as a flower, they just last for a day. So, and the buds are really tasty. They're kind of quite meaty almost, you know, they're quite substantial um, and really delicious. I don't know of any recipes unfortunately, but I think it'd be really interesting to look, look them up and see how they're used. As a plant, it's really, um, it's a tough, low maintenance plant. So really easy to grow. <clears throat> Quite
quite common. I mean, only grown ornamentally over in Britain. So most people don't eat them. I don't even know that they're edible, actually. Um, and so chosen for the garden, really, for two reasons. First of all, because they'll be really pretty. So they'll, they'll have the flowers and they'll look really nice. Secondly, so that we can eat them, you know, so we can uh, also pick the buds to eat. Um, and the, um, you can also eat the young shoots in, in spring as well. And they spread, you know, so they'll just form a nice big clump. Um, and once they get going, we uh, divided one at Cecil Sharp House earlier this year, one single plant, I think into about four or five different plants. And they've all just really happily taken root. And I think they've all flowered this year. <clears throat> they're all quite small, but they'll all build up and, and kind of get bigger quite quickly. So as a plant, I think really good plant, and the flowers provide nectar and pollen and the mass of leaves at the base, as you can see, that creates a lot of habitat for wildlife as well. So that was my first plant that I wanted to talk about. And then the second one was Allium hookeri. And we've got some Allium, quite, I think quite a few Allium hookeri actually in the garden. And their leaves are basically sort of quite flat and pointy. Um, and as an allium, it's essentially a, um, well, it's an onion, a member of the onion family. And the leaf, all parts of the plant actually are edible. But here you can see that there's a mass of leaves. So there's a lot of leaves that you can harvest. And then these are the flowers as well, which are also edible. Really pretty, quite small, um, not like the big alliums that you get that flower in late spring. Um, it originates from India where it's used extensively and um, the leaves are really good chopped in salads. So what I like about them is that they've, with chives for example, after the chives have flowered you often find that then there aren't that many leaves left or when they're flowering there aren't that many leaves. So what I like about them is that then you've got another allium plant where you can go and collect leaves and just forage for leaves. So um, they're great from that point of view, I think. You, I generally don't use the root because I want, you know, want to preserve the plant. Um, it's fantastic for bees. I mean, literally these flowers, I've seen them just covered in bees when they come out in late July. So they're much later than a lot of other alliums. Um, really really popular though and you can see partly why because there's all these little tiny flowers so it's not just one flower from a bee's point of view there's just lots all gathered together all in one place so it makes it really easy for them to go and collect the nectar and pollen um so that's on allium hookeri and gillen should i have you got some slides to share got some slides yep okay then i will now Yes, because screen sharing is disabled, so I can't do it. Yes, and I'm just uh, going to make you host. Here you go. Thank you. Don't know if I'm on my first slide there. No. Hopefully, you can see that. There we go. Okay, so. I've pinched a little bit of this from Susanna, but I've added to it. So I have been growing alongside the Scouts. As part of the Scouts workshop, I grew some of the seeds that they were given. And I had um, more than I will need in my own garden. So I'm going to, I have planted some and I will plant some more in the community garden. So I'm just going to talk about those. So squash, it's a, this, this particular squash called Gem Rollet, Rollet, I don't know how you say it. Um, there's a sort of general piece here about squashes and that they've been grown by Native Americans for thousands of years, which is Susanna's contribution that she gave to the Scouts. When they marry into another family, they, they make the offerings. It's a, a ritual um, element. And then coming on to this particular one, it's a quite small, it's a cricket ball sized fruit with dark green skin. It's a very heavy cropper in the early autumn, sort of September, October. Um, and but relatively early to mature for a squash that is, but I think in the UK you would need it to be um, maturing then because the weather starts to get cold. It's got a high sugar content, so it caramelizes beautifully when it's fried. I've never seen it in the shops, not that I'm aware of, so it seems like quite a unique one. 
apparently you can eat it whole when it's young and it's more golf ball sized as well and it's grown a lot in south africa really really popular it's like one of their main um squashes or courgette type things and they look for it when they come to the uk but it isn't that easy to find so i'd be quite interested to see what it's actually like i quite like things like this i'm happy to eat them you just cook it in the same way as you would most other things um, courgettes or whatever uh, so i've got some of those at my house but i haven't planted them yet into the garden the courgette i have added two courgettes into the garden and that first picture is one that's in the garden they haven't done amazingly well in the garden to be honest i've got some at home as well that were all grown at the same time my ones at home are much much more mature i think it's probably colder in the garden and with the wind and i'm not sure how well the, you know with the rain well it's been the lack of water even though there's been some watering and things like this but with the mulch it's sometimes it doesn't really get through to the roots when it has rained it seems because there's quite a lot of mulch there so i've cleared a bit more of a space just around the root for this so hopefully this recent rain will get through um but the picture at the bottom is one of the scouts ones where they've actually grown a courgette already mine haven't quite got to courgette my ones in my own garden but they have got big flowers on so they're almost there but the ones in the community garden are a bit behind i'm sure you all know about courgettes you've all seen courgettes you've probably all eaten courgettes they're frequently used in the uk um, but yeah they originally came from america but they're very much known as an italian thing so called zucchini in many places especially in america um, you can steam fry it you can boil it they're really tasty when they're small. You can even have them whole when they're really, really small. You see them now in the shops like that, don't you? Like mini ones that you could just cook as they are. You don't even slice it up. But if you leave it to go bigger and it turns into a marrow, um, which you can stuff or you can use them in, in cakes. Like I've said here, I've made quite a nice marrow cake, like a loaf cake that you slice, which is quite tasty. Adds a bit of depth and moisture and a slightly different flavor. It's very mild. You can't really taste it that much. Um, and then the other one I've got is a bottle gourd, a kukuza or kukuzi one. And again, the picture, the first picture on the left is the actual one that I've got that are in my house, or my garden actually, on the patio, growing. And they've got all these curly, they, 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 they aim to grow up something. So I don't quite know what we do about that in the community garden, whether we can put something in, some structure in for it to grow up. It's not very big at the moment. There's two there, which I was planning to plant out. When it matures, it has this white flower, which is quite different to the courgettes, which are yellow. And then it comes like this shape. This looks a bit like a courgette, and it sounds like it tastes a bit like one too, but it's quite a lot longer. And it has this curved shape more, and it's, it's a lighter green. So there's a bit of general information here about, about gourds. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you know, I've heard of gourds. I mean, I've heard of them being used for like drinking vessels and things like that when you dry them out. And I know, Susanna, you shared with the scouts some pictures of some instruments that are made out of dried gourd skins. They're used for all sorts of things. But I don't know what you would make out of this skin. It's not the sort of cup shape, bowl shape ones that you see people using. But some information here about, again, not something I've ever used, but you can, how you can eat it. You can eat the seeds when they're young. Um, it's got a nutty, rich squash flavour, a bit like a, a zucchini or a courgette, um, and a mild taste, but it holds its shape when you cook it. You generally would take the skin off. It's got a bit of a hard skin compared to courgette, where you usually leave it on, don't you? But, but then it sort of disintegrates in the inside. So interesting. Interested to see what they all taste like, basically, which will be different to most things we've had before. <laughs> That's great. Thanks, Gillen. Uh, we did grow um, cucumbers, a lot of the scouts, but I've only got two of those, so I'm, I'm keeping them. So <laughs> I wasn't going to plant them out. <laughs> I have grown gourds where I've just left them to trail across the ground. Oh, so we so could do that. I, I think we can those. probably do that, yeah. If I plant it in where there's enough space. Yeah. Is there a problem with uh, courgette and pollination this year? because there doesn't seem to be a lot of bees around. My neighbor who is growing a lot of uh, courgette, the other day when I was visiting her, she said that they don't self-pollinate. So she picked up a male flower 
and poked it into the female flower. And she said that that's the only way she's going to get courgettes this year. I'm surprised actually, because there have been bees around in my, in, you know, where I am now. Yes. Um, I think it's possibly because of the rain, you know, bumblebees will fly in the rain, but honeybees, especially um, honeybees that are being taken care of by humans, as it were, not wild ones. And they tend to be Italian or New Zealand honeybees. You know, the queen is, it tends to be from Italy or New Zealand and they do turn their noses up at, you know, <laughs> they don't like the rain. Not surprisingly really, because, you know, yeah. they come from hotter, hotter places, but it's also because they don't, British bees, honeybees, used to have hairs on their bodies so they could cope with the rain much better. Whereas New Zealand and Italian bees that have been introduced now they don't don't have that but I would have thought they'd be fine I mean certainly I've seen plenty of bumblebees around and honeybees and so on they've been busy so and these plants have that the scouts have grown they've all grown courgettes and they've nearly all got courgettes growing on them as well they've really? had no trouble and they're only living locally they all just live yeah. in the, you know in the local area so. I have got two plants with lots of flowers yeah and Going back to day lilies, I've got uh, orange day lilies, and because they are taking over the garden, I'm likely to uproot after they finish flowering. Cool. So I think I will bring a bunch <laughs> to plant That'd somewhere. Great. Yeah. That'd be brilliant. Yeah. Because they they're really taking over, and I'm thinking I don't want so many, <laughs> so I'll bring. That's... I think they're quite um, hardy. So I think I'll have to really dig them out and bring them on a We're fairly... The same. We've got some huge lilies. I'm not sure which lilies they are, but they tend to spread all over and we've got too many of them. So can definitely... I've got orange ones. I haven't got yeah. yellow orange ones. Yeah. yeah, I think they're quite common, the orange ones. And I mean, they're, they're yeah. all quite... That would be brilliant. Because they do... That's what's nice about them is that they're really tough. They'll spread. You'll get a really nice clump even you know in the garden yeah. and so then there's plenty to eat mm, that's what i've got like the orange big oh, yeah. flowers yeah they also have a very pretty habit they're kind of all upright like a clump yeah yeah exactly cool well that's great has anybody got any questions No? Okay. And did you find that useful? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's really interesting information. Yeah, really good. Really it was good. really good presentation. Uh, the Mulberry one. I learned a lot. <laughs> that was really interesting. Very, very interesting. Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. And how do people feel if we did this again? On yeah. different plants, obviously. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Good. Have to go good. at something else. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. yeah that'd be great. Cool. Okay. Well, um, I think that uh, brings us to the end then of this for this evening. I think we're just going to have a quick chat, aren't we, trustees, about the next workshops? Um, so I guess unless there's anything else, um, it's to is there anything else that anybody needs to say anything on watering mulching anything like that <coughs> thank, no? you. thank you thank you okay thank you. well thank you very much for coming it's really thank nice you. to see everyone and it's thank been a really good session bye see you, all so soon. See you soon bye, bye. 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 all right bye. Bye. could you just shift the host back to me oh yeah that'd be great thank you <laughs> there you go. Lovely. That's brilliant. Uh -huh. All right then. See you. Oh, <laughs> just pop back. I didn't turn the light on. It got really dark in.